Wes Bryant joins us for Wes Wednesdays, and we talk about LaMelo Ball status with the Charlotte Hornets. He's cleared health and safety protocols, but when is he going to play a game for Charlotte? We talk about that today on Locked On Hornets. You are Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. In a minute, cuz, we live. We live. We live. <laughs> It's Locked On Hornets. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day, local experts on the number one daily sports podcast network. Thanks for making Locked On Hornets your first listen. Every day, we are free and available on all platforms. That includes YouTube. Keep subscribing because we're going to have to wear the B costume soon. I don't know why I'm pubbing that, but our social media manager is, and so I feel obligated to say it. You can follow me on Twitter, by the way, at Walker Mail, Doug on Twitter at Doug Branson, L-O-H, and our show handle on Twitter at Locked On Hornets. This episode is brought to you by Truebill. Truebill is the new app that saves you money by helping you identify and stop paying for the subscriptions you don't want or need and can even negotiate better deals on those you want to keep. So we got some good news about LaMelo. We actually had some good news to discuss yesterday, despite a whooping that the Dallas Mavericks put on the Charlotte Hornets, 120 to 96. And so LaMelo cleared health and safety protocols. A whooping. Sent to Greensboro, just like Jalen McDaniels and Mason Plumley. Then we got word from James Borrego before it was official that they were expecting Mason and Jalen to go over there last night to San Antonio. McDaniels is available, so we'll see how many minutes he gets. Mason Plumley is questionable with a rib contusion, so not necessarily the protocol holding him out. A rib contusion right now. Not sure if he's going to play tonight. We do know that LaMelo Ball is not going to play against the San Antonio Spurs. We're really expecting him to play the next game on this road trip against the Portland Trail Blazers, but it's about time. You know, I'm happy that he's coming back. We got to that all yesterday, but we do have an official word on him not playing with the Spurs. He is with the Charlotte Hornets squad right now after having a practice with the Swarm, and we're expecting him to return for this Portland Trailblazer game. What do you make of all the news about LaMelo and some of these other guys' availability, Doug? Yeah, I mean, happy to happy to have him back on the squad. I mean, he's a huge part of the organization and a huge part of the team. And I, I'll say uh, we've, over the past couple of shows, been really profiling some things that the Hornets have been missing while LaMelo has been out. And I think we've missed a really obvious one, Walker. We let a pitch go by us. The, the thing that the Hornets have really been missing over the past uh, five games that he's been out is rebounding. I mean, it's it's easy to forget because LaMelo does so many amazing things with the basketball and the offensive end, his passing, his scoring. It's easy to forget that he's the Hornets' leading rebounder at 7.7 <laughs> rebounds per game. And Walker, I looked it up. Over the past five games, the Hornets have been out-rebounded in each of those games. And in the past two games, they have been getting absolutely murdered on the offensive boards. And that's what that's what LaMelo does. I mean, he's he helps you on the defensive boards. He also helps you on the offensive boards. He, he can create second-chance points all by himself. And uh, the Hornets could certainly use some easy ways to manufacture offense in the half court because we know they're not a great half court team. He helps your transition. He helps get you second chance opportunities with his rebounding in the half court. Uh, So the rebounding aspect is something we've really missed uh, as a team. Which kind of goes into his transition, as you mentioned. You want the basketball in LaMelo's hands as soon as possible because he's good for a touchdown pass, one every two contests that ends up on SportsCenter, whether it's Gordon Hayward finishing at the other end, whether it's Miles Bridges giving you a nice dunk. You want LaMelo to get that basketball as soon as he possibly can. And that's why not only the rebounding numbers, just helping secure the basketball after a miss by the opposition, you also want Charlotte to get started right away because LaMelo himself said, of the next 100 possessions you play, how many do you want to be in transition? LaMelo said 100. I want every single one of them to be a fast-paced type possession that we have with the Charlotte. So you're right. Like this is who's going to help you rebounding when Nick Richards misses time, PJ Washington misses time, who's not the greatest rebounder anyway. Same thing with Mason Plumley. His rebounding percentage isn't the best of all time, but the tallest player out there for the Charlotte Hornets. And so when LaMelo can help you like that, it really helps the team overall. But then when you even miss him, it's going to be a big part of this team and some you, kind of stat that they're the, missing. You need the gangly long arms of LaMelo Ball, the gangly the long arms of the 
of the law. Like uh, yeah, no, and, and I think you make such a great point there that that you know because we we look at players like Russell Westbrook and and Lamelo Ball, and sometimes we criticize them for stealing rebounds, for padding stats, <laughs> for their for their triple double, and PJ Washington even comically. Uh, sort of jokingly to uh, Rod Boone mentioning that he steals some of these rebounds. But that's okay because players like Russell Westbrook, what we don't really give them credit for is that they steal those rebounds, but then they immediately, and and and, we're, and that's, that's the key word immediately because it is in those split seconds where transition buckets are made or missed. It's catching the defense off guard. Jeremy Lin always used to say when he was with the Hornets, he said, this is a game of like half a step. And so LaMelo, that's what he does when he gets those rebounds and then moves it immediately into transition, the baseball passes, that's getting an extra half step that the Hornets have been missing. And uh, they, they've been retreating to the half court. They've been crashing the glass to try to get second chance points. Um, and uh, that's, you know, that's because they've been missing that element from Melo. So LaMelo is back from health and safety protocols. It's funny, not funny at all, but it's actually interesting that the Charlotte Hornets got out in front of this wave that has hit the NBA. So really, it was the Hornets kind of getting hit first hard. Mm -hmm. Then the other teams would follow suit. We saw what happened with the Chicago Bulls. Ten Chicago Bulls have entered the health and safety protocols. Five members of the Brooklyn Nets in the past week. And as of Tuesday morning, 51 NBA players have entered the HNS protocols. And so now when you look at the NBA in a real problem right now, not only the association, by the way, the NFL is going through this. The NHL right. Hurricanes games have been postponed. Their, post, their game against the Wild was postponed as well. So everybody's going through it. This is a different time of the country again, right? This is on the ascent of the COVID roller coaster. And by the way, none of these cases in the NBA have been uh, have been attributed to the Omicron variant, which is supposed to be, as studies show, a lot more spread, uh, a lot more spreadable. Um, and you see the Omicron variant uh, really being something that we're expecting to hit pretty hard, not only the NBA, not only sports leagues, but just across the country in general. Doug, what are the what is the NBA going to do? What do you think they're going to have to do as the association expects after Christmas Eve, after Christmas, the break and all of that? After the holiday season, they expect a lot more of this type of thing where maybe this isn't so much of an outlier. This just starts to become an everyday way of life um, in the NBA season. I have no idea what they're going to do, but I think it's clear they have to do something. They, may, they have to make some kind of adjustment either towards the stricter end of the spectrum or loosening up some of these uh, protocols that they have. Uh, they, they've got to make a choice, either go back to a bubble, limit the amount of fans in the arena, or go the other way and say, all right, we're going to loosen up some of these protocols. If you've tested positive, but you're not symptomatic, you can play. Uh, because you're, you're right, this Omicron variant is coming. I think more players are going to test positive. And the, the NFL and some of these other leagues are going through this thing where they to sell players on getting vaccinated, right? They said, you can get vaccinated, and if you get vaccinated, then you can just go out and, and, and do things that unvaccinated players can't do. Well, the problem with that was when when the players did that and they they got vaccinated and then they went and lived their lives and, and were essentially restriction free on what they could do and how they could do it. They got COVID because, you know, the, the, the breakthrough cases, we know that's that's a possibility. But they didn't get serious or as, as far as I know. I mean, I don't know of many players in the NBA that have gotten seriously ill from this. Uh, we know Joel Embiid uh, has been struggling with getting back from this, and we know that players have been symptomatic. Terry mentioning how uh, he felt in his uh, article with uh, Rod Boone of the Charlotte mm -hmm. Observer recently. So we know players are symptomatic, but are they getting seriously ill? Is it time for the NBA to say, okay, uh, we, we live in this world where we're playing indoors. We want to play with fans. People have had time and resources available to them to get vaccinated. We know that if you're vaccinated, you may get it, but you might not be uh, seriously ill. Uh, you know, uh, do we start to loosen those restrictions a little bit? I, I think the, the NBA has got a tough decision. And here's the more interesting part. If they do loosen the restrictions, what do you say to teams like the Charlotte Hornets? What do you say to teams like the Chicago Bulls who have had to postpone games 
And that, that's if you're lucky. If you're Chicago's lucky that they got to postpone the games. The Hornets have had to play without five players. It's totally unfair to the Charlotte Hornets that they have had to bear the brunt of these protocols and some of these other teams that have had to bear the brunt of these protocols. And then if you do loosen restrictions, what do you say to those teams that have, I mean, it was without a question, the Hornets have, it has cost them games, these protocols. Oh yeah. And, and that's true. I, I think if you're the NBA, I, I, I don't know how much that's going to be part of the decision-making and I fair. it's not, I want the Charlotte Hornets to get as many resources as possible when they're playing these games. I want to see them mm-hmm. in the postseason. It's a huge year for all involved. I don't know if the NBA is going to look at that and say, well, it wasn't fair for this team. So maybe this is going to dictate how we operate going forward with the spread that is happening at a higher rate at this point. And when you and we talk about the NBA, that the quote unquote good news is that team officials, GMs, anybody higher up in the NBA do feel like this is a lot more manage, manageable situation than it was even a year ago because of all of the vaccinations that you have within the association. The NBA said about 97% of the players are vaccinated. The league has encouraged all eligible players and team staff to receive booster shots, not vaccinated, but encouraged. And through Monday, we had reports about 200 players have gotten booster shots, and it's expected that number will increase in the days ahead. So we'll see exactly what happened. Now, the NBA did impose a December 17 deadline, so just a couple days away for players who are eligible to receive booster shots. And so for eligibility play, or for eligible players who don't receive the booster, they'll be faced with stricter protocols. So they're doing the same thing again, right? It's, it's just now with the face of booster shots, um, you know, trying to figure out how they can get players to, to get more of the December 17th, they'll face restrictions on their interactions with players and their access on the court and team travel. We know how Canada operates a little differently. And so you have to wonder if that different type of protocol, once again, is going to help these players get boosters. And then once you have, I don't know what the percentage is going to look like when when these players have boosters, which is helping. I, I don't know, but I think maybe, I wonder if they make decisions based off of how many players they actually have going through this. And once they do that, okay, we have 97% that have gotten boosted. Now's the time where we even ease up those protocols a little bit more so. And then, you know, for the people that aren't that that's when we start to have to worry a little bit and they're not allowed, you know, to, to get with these players that are right. I I don't know. It's going to happen. I, I do feel like it's a little scary for the NBA to start to ease up too much because then you have to worry about the one case that is a problem because the one person that is vaccinated where maybe they are experiencing harsher conditions, that one player, the NBA is going to take a lot of heat for that. Is that a risk you're willing to take? You know, perhaps the risk isn't huge because that's unlikely, but if it happens, you got to be prepared for what's to come after that. Yeah, but I think that everything the NBA has done to this point to encourage players to get vaccinated and to get boosted has, in my opinion, has covered them to a certain extent if a worst case scenario were to happen. Because everyone's dealing with this. Every workplace and every home Mm -hmm. is dealing with this sort of risk or reward kind of uh, calculation that they have to make um, when when dealing with this thing. And, And Omicron... I, I can't imagine that Omicron is going to be the last variant that we that we have to deal with. And so, you know, I think the NBA should look should should maybe look a little bit forward and say, all right, you know, we've we've made these resources available. Most of our players are vaccinated. It might be time to figure out how to play with this thing as opposed to trying to play without this thing. Um, I, I think it's it's worth examining, but I agree with you there is a liability mm-hmm. uh, thing to all of this that that probably weighs heavy in the calculation. Well, yeah, and I know this wasn't your resolution to it. You did mention the bubble, and that, that it just seems like that's not a solution anymore with mental health. No, I don't, health I don't and, think that – and people people have been mentioning taking a pause. I don't think that's going to happen so, either. So, I, I just don't think that's, that's in the cards. Right. We've gone through this already to the point where a lot of money was lost. They ain't doing that again. The bubble was instituted, and it was really good. It was fantastic. They executed it to a T. The problem is there were so many players that were dealing with mental health issues because you were away for so long and your access was accounted for constantly and where your and your whereabouts accounted for constantly. You know, the articles about that place and, and, and that time 
on these NBA players. It, it just can't happen again. And so it'll be interesting to see how the NBA reacts to all of this. All right, let's get to Wes Bryant. He's going to join us in just a moment. You know, Wes Bryant knows about all of the stylish clothes that fit him. And also he feels good wearing them. That hoodie looked really comfortable as well that he wore that Charlotte Hornets one the other day. Well, let's talk about stands because they, uh, they are experts in comfort as well as being stylish. It's founded in two, uh, it was founded in 2009. Stance apparel represents a radical reinvention of socks, underwear, and active apparel with a sharp focus on comfort, quality, and creativity. Stance brings an atypical aesthetic alongside some of pop culture's hottest collaborators for the ultimate in style and self-expression because everything you wear should be a direct extension of who you are and how you feel. Stance believes that the perfect fit matters more than fitting in that those who feel good do good. Go see for yourself. Register for an account at stance.com and get 15% off your first purchase. Use promo code locked on at checkout to apply. Enjoy the color and comfort of a life less ordinary with Stance. Wes Bryant joining us in just a moment on the Locked On Hornets podcast. This is Locked On Hornets. You know, you give them the pink to let them know you have the a little bit of a softer side, but you give them the it's time for more of the Locked on Hornets podcast. So Doug has left us, but that's okay. We got Wes Bryant joining us for West Wednesdays, as always, styled up in the fluorescent teal Charlotte Hornets jacket. I'm feeling it, man. As always, how are you doing, Wes? I'm good, man. A lot of people uh, like this jacket, man. I got this a couple of weeks ago, so I, mm. I get uh, good compliments on this thing. As always, I mean, every single shirt you wear, every single jacket you wear, <laughs> that's what we hear anytime yeah, you join us. You go underneath. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Of course. Yes, of course I like that. Let's get to some breaking news. I mean, literally, Wes, just 10 minutes ago, this was tweeted yeah. out as of this recording. So we talked, me and Doug did in the first segment, how LaMelo Ball was cleared from health and safety protocols. Mason Plumley, he's cleared, but he's got a really contusion so we don't know if he's going to play tonight against the Spurs Jalen McDaniels is available then we get another tweet just 10 minutes ago from the Hornets updating everybody that Ish Smith has been cleared from health and safety protocols he's been assigned to the Greensboro Swarm which is something the Hornets have been doing for a conditioning and a rehab assignment he'll practice with the Swarm today here's where it gets a little confusing to me also the tweet says LaMelo has been assigned to the Swarm and will practice with the team today as well well if you go back to the their update yesterday, they said that LaMelo Ball would go back. Uh, they were recalled back up to the team. And so roster update after practicing with Greensboro today, this was yesterday we're tweeting this after practicing with Greensboro yesterday, the team has recalled LaMelo, Mason and Jalen, and they'll have the following report for to for tonight's game. LaMelo is going to be out, Mason questionable, and uh, Ish Smith is going to be out, but Jalen McDaniels is also going to be available. So the only weird thing about this to me, Wes, is the fact that LaMelo was supposed to go to Greensboro for a little bit. Then he supposedly got recalled to the Charlotte Hornets. Apparently he's practicing with the Swarm today. Now, you can practice today and then, I guess, fly out to San Antonio and just be with the team getting ready to go to Portland. But just pretty interesting how they're deciding to handle this with the conditioning and the rehab assignments, immediately calling them back. Terry Rozier did not have to go to Greensboro once he was cleared from health and safety protocol. I don't know if that means that one of these guys has tested positive for COVID. We can mm-hmm. speculate, but we're not sure exactly who was testing positive, who was a contact trace. Not exactly sure, but kind of interesting. Either way, it's nice to see uh, LaMelo at least cleared, and he's on track to play against Portland. Oh, definitely. The more bodies the Hornets can get back, the better. Uh, they need all the playmaking and scoring that they can get uh, at this point. If anything, just to... Uh, get the rotation where guys aren't playing as many minutes as they have been playing with all the bodies out. But, yeah, it is a little bit difficult, man. It feels like back in the day not to be, you know, old guy on the yard. But I'm like, man, these guys come back now and they have to do these rehab assignments and mm-hmm. stuff like baseball. Back in the day, you could miss a month and you would come back and they put you in the starting line. Right away. You know what I'm saying? You're ready to go. So that's what I thought would happen with LaMelo with him being so integral to the team's success. So, yeah. I would think the scenario you came up with is plausible. That maybe one was yeah. uh, someone was sick, more sick than the other, and needs 
the conditioning and, and different things like that. So I'm guessing that's the way it goes. We'll mm-hmm. probably never find out or, you know, sources leak different things. So maybe <laughs> right. we will. But, um, yeah, it's definitely an interesting situation for sure. But either way, LaMelo cleared the protocol. So if all he needs is just to get his win back, then, hey, we can deal with that for another game or so. So you look tonight against San Antonio. Don't know about Mason. Jalen's going to be available. They got P.J. Washington and Nick Richards back. Ish Smith not going to play, although he's cleared. And so you're still missing a couple of guys. Terry Rozier looked pretty good in his first game back after clearing protocol. So that was nice to see against Dallas. Not too many other players looked good against the Mavericks. It was one of the worst losses that they've had this season. So hopefully they can bounce back. What are the chances you think the Hornets can bounce back tonight against San Antonio? And what are some of the things you're looking for, Wes? Uh, I think they can. This is not an insurmountable opponent. I mean, we're talking about a team that's 11 in the NBA and scoring. They're pretty good at scoring near the rim, but not the greatest shooting team uh, that you'll find 14th and three-point percentage. So they're middle of the pack as well as defensively. A thing that you uh, think about with a, a Greg uh, Popovich-led team, you think defensively they're going to be stalwarts, but you look at their, uh, you know, their 19th in opponent's points per game and 21st in field goal percentage. So not a team that you're going in there looking like, man, we've got a giant mountain to climb. We know San Antonio has always been a tough place to play. They love their Spurs. But if this one's team can come in and get back to playing the way uh, that we know that they can, high energy, passing the basketball, taking care of the basketball, because that is something that the Spurs do. Uh, You know, so they need to come in and make sure Mm -hmm. that they're getting back to playing how they play. And one thing I like in Intangible coming in tonight is, I hate it how bad the Hornets got beat by the Mavericks, but I'm always for the psychology of a game and uh, of teams. And I think with the Hornets getting embarrassed the way they did the other night, uh, I'm not sure why that happened or if it was just one of those nights, but I think their attention will definitely be a little bit more sharp than going into San Antonio tonight. So I think the Hornets will get it done. Yeah, you don't want to have that game two times in a row because then that gets all that much more embarrassing. Like people will give you somewhat of a pass, especially with the Hornets, because you were missing guys for so long. They just came back against Dallas. Okay, we'll live with it once. Man, it would be really disappointing to see it happen twice to start off this road trip. And this is the time to capitalize, Wes, because you are talking about three games in a row where you have teams that are not the greatest, either under 500, hovering around 500, and even Portland right now. They're going through it with all this Damian Lillard controversy. So you have three games here that I would like to go two and one in. Uh, You lost against Dallas. Man, it would be nice for the Hornets to get this win against San Antonio, get a win against Portland. And then if you lose to Phoenix, who's fantastic, you lose to Utah playing a lot better recently, and you lose to Denver, that's just a matchup nightmare with Nikola Jokic, a big guy. Hornets always struggle with the really talented offensive big guys. If you go two and four, Of course, all of us, I think, would like to shoot for 500, but those are really good teams on the back end of this. I was hoping for a two and four type of stretch where, Wes, it's not a disaster. It's not, I don't think it's this, you know, profound success that the Hornets were able to succeed if that is the case. But for me, like, realistically, a record I'm cool with, I'm shooting for two and four on this road trip. Where, what are you thinking for these next six games, including the Dallas game that they played and how well you'll feel about it all at the end? Yeah, I think about the same as they begin to get guys back. But being a native Charlottean, not a homer in the least, but I came up with this theory years ago called Queen City Magic, where <laughs> when found, things just happen that aren't supposed to happen. Teams beat teams they're not supposed to beat. I feel like the Hornets are going to pick off one of these teams, and I swear to the public I'm not saying this being a homer, uh, but that's just the way Charlotte sports has been. We've seen it all our lives. The Panthers come in against these great opponents sometimes, and they find a way to play out of body and beat them. The Hornets have done the same thing back in the day when they used to beat MJ or when they used to beat the Lakers all the time with Shaq and Kobe and or when they would, you know, find a way to pick off the Lakers in one of those two matchups. So I think the Hornets, one of those games, they are going to pick off one of those teams. I'm not sure which one is going to yeah. be, but they have a chance to finish 500. But defensively, that's the thing that's the most disheartening that you're like, well, in order for them to do that, they're going to have to have some great defensive efforts, including tonight uh, against San Antonio, because defensively the numbers just aren't where you want them to be. 
we know they hit that stretch where they were really locking teams up and really playing gritty defense, but now it's starting to soften back up again. So the Hornets defensively need to get things back in order if we are to get that three and three mm-hmm. or even that two and four finish. So yeah, uh, that's yeah. Why I'm if they can steal one, that'd be great. And then when you talk about the Queen City Magic, that was great. The thing is, they would compete with the teams they weren't supposed to and eventually pull off the win. Problem was, they would lose to some teams that they weren't supposed exactly. to, and that's what would exactly. keep them Queen down. City but I, I like that. For sure. Yeah. Queen City Magic all day. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Hopefully that can show up tonight against San Antonio for sure, but then even against some of these better teams at the end of the road trip. Again, Phoenix, they're going to have Utah, and then Denver to finish out this six-game road trip. Let's take a quick break, but at first, I do want to talk to you about Bet Online. Bet Online, we've always appreciate them supporting the show. They've got you covered all season for more props, odds, and lines than ever before. They've re- they remain your number one spot for all the sports action this season, and you can head to the new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use the promo code locked on to receive your bonus from basketball, football, NHL, boxing, USC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and the easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Bet online where the game starts. Also want to discuss Built Bar because I just got a package yesterday. I ate the raspberry puff chocolate. So good. And I feel like they continue to tamper a little bit with the ingredients because this one just tasted better than the last one. I don't know what's happening. Talk about the Queen City magic. We got Built Bar magic as well. This holiday season, grab the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar or even better than a candy bar. Filled with so much holiday goodness, rich with decadent flavor, covered in chocolate, but amazingly low in calories, sugar, net carbs, and fat, but also it's high in protein. So go to Built.com, use promo code LOCKED15 and get 15% off your order. Again, go to Built.com, promo code is LOCKED15 and get 15% off of your order. Wes Bryant sticking around with us for one more segment. We're going to talk Steph Curry. Is there a chance we ever get Steph Curry in a Hornets uniform, giving us some Tom Brady time? We'll talk about that next on Locked on Hornets. This is Locked on Hornets. My uh, my fourth cousin twice removed is Gary Busey, who is considered one of the greatest American actors of all time. So Are I'm we totally, doing this? I've, I've got one to contribute. I, I, I don't know. I, I, was, I was completely alive. But. I, man, I fell for it. I really thought. <laughs> he's just such a random name to bring up. <laughs> I thought Gary Busey was going to be it. It's time for more of the Locked on Hornets podcast. Walker Mail, Wes Bryant with you. Follow Wes, by the way, on Twitter at Westcott Range. Not only is he talking about the Hornets as a Charlotte Hornets insider, but he's also talking about um, ACC football. Got some big news there. Tony Elliott going to Virginia. Duke making a new hire as well. So go follow him again on Twitter at Westcott Range. Wes, I want to talk to you a little bit about some history made last night by a Charlottean. How about Steph Curry? Back from his Charlotte Christian days, going to Davidson and going on that Elite Eight run with the Davidson Wildcats. Almost a Final Four run, but they lose by two to the eventual champs in the Kansas Jayhawks. And now here he is, the three-point champ and and unquestionably the best shooter of all time. We didn't even need to see what happened last night in order to have that kind of opinion. But he passed Ray Allen. I think it was 2,974 that eventually would be the record-breaking mark. And this was awesome to see from somebody that was doing it here in the Queen City, and now everybody knows his name. Everybody knows his name ever since that 08 run that he had with the Wildcats, putting that program on the map. But really cool to see that last night, Wes, and I know uh, you took note of it as well. It was really cool. My son, who's 10 years old, uh, he came in, and and we watched it together. And I told him it was a really cool moment because I said one day when I'm old and you're older. I said, they'll show this highlight on TV because, you know, when we were kids, we would see different stuff and there were records that were broken, but you would see some of the clips of stuff from yesteryear and you're like, man, that, you know, that was pretty cool. So, so my son, I said, man, you know, when, when I'm old and you're older, mm-hmm. we'll see this highlight forever. And I'll say, man, you remember when we watched this together on that, you know, that Tuesday night or whatever. So it was great, man. Uh, I've been a huge fan of Steph uh, since his freshman year at Davidson. So it was tremendous to see that. Uh, he, another one of my Queen City isms, he is the head of what I call the Queen City Icons, yeah. uh, which is an exclusive <laughs> group with <laughs> him and Ric Flair and others. I feel like my seat at the table uh, is getting there coming from uh, Chambers High School to 
uh, to, to Valley Sports doing my thing covering the Hornets. But there you go. Complete a season or two before I get, uh, you know, seat at the <laughs> table with those guys. But no, it was, uh, you know, it was phenomenal. I think it's going to be one of those sports records that's going to be very difficult to break uh, just because of how he shoots, how much longer uh, he has to play. But just really a moment in time. Uh, and and been a Warriors fan and people, especially when they started winning the championships, they're like, oh, you just bandwagon. But I'm like, man, I went to see them play. I believe it was on a Black Friday. They came and played the Hornets way back in the day when it was him mm. and Monte Ellis in the back. Yeah. And so I, I've been a fan of him since then. I got to see him play twice at Davidson. Um, so, yeah, it was just tremendous. Well, and, and I imagine a lot of people got to see him because, again, here he is playing locally at a program where it's not like it's the hardest thing to do to get tickets. Maybe it was a little harder back then when Steph Curry was playing. But I remember going to a Warriors game as well. In fact, I went to a Golden State game where it might have been Steph Curry's rookie year. So many Steph Curry, Davidson Wildcats jerseys in the arena at that time, Time Warner Cable Arena. So everybody was there to see Steph. And I remember, I think I've mentioned this before, like somebody else tweeted at me saying they have this too, but they gave out Gerald Wallace shooting sleeves that I still have in my display case somewhere. And so they gave oh, those wow. out at a Golden State Warriors game where Steph Curry was a rookie. I think it was his first time coming back home. So that was really cool. And of course, getting to see him blossom into the player that he is. One of the best of all time, certainly the best shooter of all time. Extremely cool to see what happened in the garden last night, no less. A team that you thought maybe he would go to if he just lasted a little bit longer, but the Knicks don't have that chance to pick him. Instead, Golden State decides to select him, and history is made right after that. Could we see some more history, Wes, with Steph Curry? possibly coming back home. Look, this is a topic that has been tossed around a few times here and there, especially more so when we thought maybe we saw the downfall of the Golden State Warriors, but now they're right back up. So maybe this topic kind of withers away a little more. We know that, you know, Tom Brady finishes his career with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. We see it from stars all the time. It's still pretty rare to see a star play their entire career with just one franchise. Could we see in your eyes a possibility of Steph at some point in his NBA career before it's done play in a Charlotte Hornets uniform just like his dad did? This is a topic that I have broached uh, as well with friends over the years, and I definitely am in the crowd that says that. Uh, when, because especially when you talk of Tom Brady time, that would be great if he could come here and win us a championship. All right. But I think that we would get – the Steph that comes in, he's still got some game to him, but he's 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 certainly not against being a role player. And he can come in and just with his shooting alone, get you 12 to 15. And on a given night, he might show you why he is who he is. He might come in and hit eight, nine, ten threes. Yeah. And show everybody, you know, that he is the legend. Uh, but I, I certainly subscribe to that. I think it's going to be a little bit later down the road. But I just think for every player, especially of that ilk, uh, it means something special to be able to get to go home, play in front of the hometown fans, and be able to help the hometown team. Especially, I mean, if you're talking LaMelo does a second deal, you know, LaMelo's in his sixth, seventh season, and the Hornets, you know, have a good team there, Eastern Conference contender perhaps. Uh, then I think you certainly could see Steph come in and say, hey, I can help out here uh, and, and just contribute, you know, where I can and not be the focal point of the team anymore. So to answer your question, I was a long winded way of saying, yes, I certainly think Steph will play here in a Hornets jersey uh, before it's all said and done. Yeah, we can't get Tom Brady time winning an NBA Finals. I don't think we're going to get that. But maybe we just look, let's go to the obvious example and go Ray Allen. Can we get Miami Heat Ray Allen type style from Steph Curry where exactly. he can still come in and help out? Not saying again, I guess that's another championship team, but you get the deal. We know no, about Ray exactly Allen. Yeah, yeah. Like we get the Ray Allen role with Steph Curry still being an amazing shooter. You bring up whether that record is ever going to be broken. It's interesting because we have these types of conversations with other records. We know about the Cal Ripken consecutive game record. To me, it's almost like the most unbreakable record we've ever seen. Man, you, you got to think at some point there's going to be a really talented shooter that comes in and can at least approach Steph. But this number is going to be ridiculous, Wes. 
like I mean, it's it's the only guy that has these multiple three hundred three point made seasons, the four hundred made three pointers that he had, and it doesn't seem like he's slowing up. He's still shooting forty percent from three. He's still shooting at a crazy high volume. I don't expect it to wither away in the next couple of seasons. So he's going to continue to add to this. He stayed relatively healthy. Had the one season where, um, you know, it was lost just a few years back. But I, man, like. He's just so incredible shooting from the hip, off the dribble, unbelievably high percentage on the type of volume he takes. It, it really might be unbreakable. I just can't see uh, what is a better version of Steph, like literally pulling from half court four times a game. I, that That's what it almost takes to be better than Steph. And I just I can't fathom that. I can't fathom there being a basketball player like that. Yeah, and I think that when you talk about the main thing for me with Steph, not only is the volume with which he shoots, but the accuracy in which uh, he shoots. I think they showed last night, um, I think it was like 43% or something like that. Yeah, that's his career shooting percentage. Exactly, his career. Yeah, so that's the thing for me that is going to make it the most difficult to break is how many guys are we going to see coming to the league and be that prolific uh, of a shooter with that type of accuracy? And that that's the number one thing. Trey Young, yes, he can fire it up. He can shoot it, but he's a little bit kind of, volume ish as far as he shoots yeah. a decent percentage but he's not stuff like and you know guys that can come in and have a eight for 13 eight for 14 night a couple times a week so that's the the part to me that will make it the most difficult is yeah there may be some guys that do get to take 10 or 11 threes uh and and i mean we say that we didn't see Steph Curry coming and there are a lot of, you know, when there's somebody that comes in that changes the game, there's always a baby version of them somewhere in this universe where there's some little kid that's, that's out there right now, seven years old, firing up threes and can already shoot mm-hmm. them really well. So there could be somebody that comes out of the woodworks. But I just think with how much longer I think Steph has at least five to seven, I would say four to six, four to seven more seasons in him at least. So, well, I won't say at least on the back end of that, but I'd say four to seven. No, I got you. Because when you're a shooter like that, you can play for a long time. Um, I mean, when you can shoot like that, teams will bring you in just off the bench and say, hey, we'll give you 10 minutes a game. We just need you to hit three, four threes. And he can do that for sure. So the accuracy is the main thing that makes me think it's going to put it out of touch for someone for at least a – the foreseeable future. Yeah, well, and, and even guys like Kevin Durant is one of the best shooters of all time, but he'll have a season where he shoots 37, you know, even 38. If you shoot 38% from three in a year, then you are off pace from Steph Curry range by a lot. And 38 yes. is really good on high volume. 38 is amazing. It, it really is un- unbelievable. And I keep going back to, you know, you're right. There might be this kid that is ready to bless us with his presence 20 years from now that is just an otherworldly shooter. But man, does that mean that he's pulling up as soon as he crosses half court and hitting that at a high volume? I I cannot wrap my brain around that. And then you talk about this new adaptation to the way he shoots, because right now, part of the reason we call him the best shooter ever is his ability to shoot from the hip off of the dribble, you know, even just running around screens, Rip Hamilton, like just constantly moving half court. You know, we know that Steph has a lot of different ways in order that he can shoot the basketball. And so then, okay, we, we graduate from that to being more Kyle Korver like, you know, not tall enough, not tall as Kyle Korver, but like now we're just saying, okay, dude, you don't have the quickness to beat anybody off the dribble anymore. We're just going to keep running you off of these screens, trying to free you up as much. So, so even that has a new life of its own, you know, just Ray Allen like again, it's, it's crazy, Wes. Like I, it, I, I'm so happy to have been able to see him play, especially when we talk about even the early stages, we got to see this book written you got from to see the fair finish. I mean, crazy. You know, absolutely insane. And so we'll see if he ever plays in a Charlotte Hornets uniform. That would be very cool to see. Wes Bryant, cool to see you in the Charlotte Hornets jacket right here on the Lockdown Hornets podcast. Join us again next week for Wes Wednesdays. Wes, always appreciate the time, man. Thanks again. Thanks, man. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it a lot. Check us out on Valley. Check us out the ACC Digital Network, man. Just check me out everywhere. I'm on. Well, Wes got range. Wes got a lot of range. He's a renaissance man. Check him <laughs> out man, anyway. Take it easy. Absolutely. You too, Wes. Thanks again for joining us here on the podcast. And thank you guys, everybody, for listening to Locked on Hornets. Make sure you join us tomorrow. Julian Council scheduled to join us to talk a little bit about the Hornets. Now make your second listen, Locked on Bets, your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs. Locked on Bets, hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis 
analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. It's free and available on all platforms. We'll be uh, we'll be back with you tomorrow. Have a great rest of your day.